I'm Dustin Huffman of the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, and this is Brazil. Come along with me on this series as I tour some of the agricultural areas of Brazil. From Minas Gerais and Brasilia to Mato Grosso and Rio de Janeiro, I will show you the farms, industries, and the people that have forged Brazil into a large player in the global ag marketplace. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of our series chronicling my trip to Brazil earlier this year. I'm Dustin Huffman on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. Well, obviously, in Iowa, we don't get to do a whole lot with the cotton portion of the agriculture industry. However, we are always grateful for the work that our brothers and sisters in agriculture do across the country and around the globe, whether it's from the clothes we're wearing, from the cotton swabs we have to use, or whatever else we need cotton for. We're always grateful to have it because we just don't have the climate to produce it. But just like in America, Brazil has a thriving cotton industry. And so that's where I'm going to take you today into Minas Gerais and their cotton growing areas. Now, if you're watching this from an area of the country that does do some cotton work, well, obviously you can come along and see the similarities and the differences between how Brazil does things compared to the cotton growers in the United States. But first, let's learn a little about the industry, and we're going to take you to the one of the largest agricultural operations in Minas Gerais, where they are producing more cotton than you could even fathom. The cotton is about 20,000 acres of cotton. So they, they used to plant a little bit more, but they're doing some more rotation, so it's come down a little bit, a bit to 20,000. Uh, so this is their just their cotton gin. Now, I, obviously it's not running, but you can see some of their cotton warehouse, which I think is kind of interesting, their cotton seed. And this is uh, Giovanni. 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 He's the manager here on, the, on this uh, at the gym. So, so it was this gym site was strategically chosen because it's in the middle of of their properties because they're all spread out. They're in this region, but they're all spread out around it. Hoje nós temos aqui uma capacidade de beneficiar 350 toneladas de algodão por dia. They can produce or, or gin, excuse me, 350 tons of cotton per day. It's the off season right now, and so they're doing maintenance on everything. So as soon as they really finish the prior season, they start taking everything apart. It's a lot of work. Got to replace all the bearings, and get it all ready. If I come back one, May or June. So they'll start the end of May is when they'll start back up again when the harvest can begin. Yeah. It, the cotton represents about uh, a little over a third of the company's yeah, total revenue. So uh, 85 to 90 percent of the cotton produced here is consumed within the state. Uh, so they have direct agreements with textile mills within the state and they actually get a, a added premium for that because it's produced within the state of up to seven and a half cents a pound. So when you harvest the cotton from the field it's raw cotton or what we would call seed cotton and so you're bringing it here the the gin serves two purposes it's to separate the seed from the fiber and then to help clean it and so what they're bringing here when you take the seed cotton you bring it here um, ideally 41 42 percent of that is really only the fiber that they're keeping and of course they track that if you get 40 percent overall or 42 percent two percent could mean over a huge amount, it could be millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then I think he said 53% is the actual seed. And the seed has a lot of value too. It's um, high in protein. Um, Carol used to buy a lot of cotton seed for the, the dairy, or they still do. Uh, and so it's a, almost like a, a, a DDG, I suppose, in a sense. But uh, and then that the difference is the, the trash. So it, there's, you know, Five, six, seven percent of it could be trash that's coming from the field. They've only finished uh, um, ginning for a little over a month now, and uh, all the trash has been cleaned up and gone. So they actually sell that as cattle feed, 
you know, it doesn't bring a high price, but it's better than burning it, you know. You're not going to do anything else with it. So it has a little bit of nutritional value. The main systems in there, they have 90, there's 90 saws in each. I'll so, probably show you the saws in there. And uh, it's a much older system, but they, they do a lot of work to preserve it, as he says. And uh, a lot of people say they like the older systems because they aren't built for speed or volume. The newer equipment, they are built for output, right? Get it through there, and it can end up burning or singeing the cotton and, and hurt the quality a little bit. I'm sure a cotton gin salesman might disagree, but that's kind of the, the impression and the experience that, that uh, they have. To manage is these require more labor, but uh, you get better quality. Um, it's maybe aesthetically not as pleasing as, as some of the newer ones, but uh, they they feel like they get good good quality cotton with it. This is a very old piece of equipment. This is like 60 years old, so there's a lot of maintenance involved in this. But I mean, a new a new one to replace all this would be several million dollars. Vai chegar um ponto hoje que acontece, pela, nós já chegamos a beneficiar 13 mil hectares de algodão com essas máquinas. Né? Eu falo assim, enquanto, enquanto tiver a possibilidade de beneficiar, beleza. Vai chegar um ponto, né? They, nós falei, mão de obra, você tem que migrar. Eles tiveram anos quando os preços eram melhores, eles plantaram mais cotton. Então eles têm harvestado, eles têm ginado 30,000 hectares de cotton por esse todo o sistema antes. And so now they're, they've reduced a little bit. They're at 20,000 acres of cotton. So he's not so sure that they're going to run to replace this just yet when they've been lowering the cotton acres. But yeah, he's, he's maybe hopeful long term that they'll look to replace this with new technology. So. Three separate systems running together. So each one has their own press. So the cotton comes through here, brought up here, drops down the chute. And this is the cotton press. This is what presses it into a bale. At 200 kilos? 200 kilos. Every bale is 200 kilos, so 440 pounds. That's the 440 pounds is the standard size in Brazil for cotton bale. Uh, and the international standard is a bit more. It's 480. 220 inches international. Yeah. So if you're, as long as you're not exporting too much, 200 kilos is just fine. If you're going to export, or you plan on exporting a lot, that means you might have to just get a different press, so you're doing a little bit bigger bales. So you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. So these, these are the trailers that are hauling the cotton from the field. So they're taking those round bales and, and setting them on all these trailers. Now they just parked them here in the off season for now. So imagine these are all out of the way. This is what, how you bring them in. You set them all in in rows. You see these are like railings, there's the module feeder at the end we'll walk to, and that just slowly glides over the top of these rails, and it's just tearing back apart the cotton, opening it up, and dumping it on this conveyor belt, which takes the cotton all the way down the end, sucks it up, over into the other room, and starts that process. This is your module feeder, right here. So this just rolls all the way down, rolls all the way down, and it's just grinding it up in there. And then when it's done, it just, they bring it back, load it up, and start it all over again. You were saying before that the, the textile companies in Minas Gerais will pay a premium to get it from here. Why? You know, sometimes with business models, it makes sense to go cheaper. Why are they willing to pay a premium to get it here? It's, it's more like a, it's a, it's a state uh, subsidized program okay. to incentivize um, both the cotton producer and the textile kind of mill. Keep it local. Keep, yeah, yeah. Keep okay. it growing and keep it local. Yeah. Okay. How long will this stay quality wise? Aqui pode armazenar quanto tempo? O caroço, o ideal é o seguinte: terminou de benefício, depois do benefício, uns seis meses mais ou menos. Ideally, within six months, have it all shipped out. Ele pode ficar, só porque ele tem um risco muito grande. E ele costuma sair um tipo um desorrinho, um caruncho. Entendeu? Porque ele é muito difícil de controlar, porque você não consegue um, um pulverizar inseto, ele. É, um inseto, entendeu? Uh -huh. Então, se ele ficar muito tempo, ele começa a dar... Você disse que ele pode ficar mais longo, mas tem alguns insetos que podem entrar e uh -huh. contaminar e causar problemas. Now, are they strictly selling to buyers here in the state, or are they marketing elsewhere around the country and where else? Então, você vende só para as empresas aqui em Mineiro. 
É, hoje, hoje o mercado dele, 90%, 80% já é direto para produtor rural. Entendeu? Produtor rural e cooperativa. Que é de... the, the, the cotton or cotton seed? Cotton seed. Cotton seed. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much 90% of it sold Thanks within here. state. Yeah. Okay, and then he markets everywhere the, cotton, the finished product as he, well? he sells that, he said 85% within the state. state. Okay. Yeah. É, em questão de mercado, né? Como eu disse, Minas hoje consome, consome aí quase duas vezes a produção. Estou falando de caroço, Minas consome hoje quase duas vezes a nossa produção. A produção que eu falo de todo o estado. Então o estado consome duas vezes o que está produzindo em cotton. E se você acha que essa pile de cotton é impressionante, just take a look at this warehouse. As you look down that hallway, that's not just one warehouse you're seeing. That goes into a second building, and this is just one hallway in those two massive buildings. And what you're looking at here now is a system that sprays a little bit of moisture into the air to help keep the cotton from completely drying out. This helps maintain its quality during storage until it can be shipped out to the textile companies. After it's ginned, it's obviously all brought in here and it's all organized and stacked according to its grade. And so each, that's what these holes are in, are in it. Nobody just come and split a hole through here for no reason. They came in, they just took a random cotton sample on there, and then they have a special room that they classify it, and then it's all organized and stacked accordingly. So it's all the same, uh, same grade. I mean, they could tell his buyers the entire characteristics of the cotton, um, you know, before they even see it, and so it's, yeah, it's all just separa separated accordingly. You could probably grab... This is only 20 cents. Can you do that? <laughs> Just put it back when you're done. Put it back when you're done. Their contracts, they contract, you know, at least 70% of their cotton, like the cotton that they just planted now that's growing, like almost 70% of it is already sold, he said. And so they're doing contracts, I think he said from like July to March. And so we're in January, so he said most of this is already sold. It's just waiting for trucks to come and deliver it, you know, periodically each mace, each month, uh, according to the, uh, <laughs> according to the uh, top period that they contracted for. So now the, this just represents one season or a part of a season of their crop, or is this multiple seasons? This is How long one is this season. Day? In Masafa. Masafa. Yeah, okay. it's one season. Is quantos one quantos one? dollars tem aqui? Tem alguma ideia? <laughs> I asked them how many dollars are we looking at in cotton? 10.6 million dollars of cotton in this whole warehouse. E um fardinho é quantos? US. US. Talking about the fire safety, because a, a lot of gins, well the one that we drove by, you saw that the cotton was outside under that uh, gray plastic. And that's really how most gins probably do it. These guys are maybe high rollers, so they can afford to build this whole infrastructure for that. But uh, the risk is maybe a little bit higher risk of fire, um, you know, when you're putting it in an enclosed environment like this. And so he's talking about some of the safety procedures, like number one being you're monitoring each bale that comes in before you're stacking it, because that's where your biggest problem is, is, is the, you know, the bales can catch fire, can start smoking, you know, there at the gin. And so, you obviously want to catch that before you stack it in the middle here, things like that. So, uh, just the way that they structure it. I mean, you could uh, you could see the the gaps here a little bit more. Some of that's maybe a bit more uh, strategic in the way they're doing it, so they can access certain bales quicker if there was an accident waiting to happen. If he's arguing that having this type of storage builds credibility with the buyers, because a lot of people, you know, the buyers are concerned, oh, if it's stored outside, you know, was it really taken care of, you know, did it get wet? But they know, okay, these guys, they have that indoor storage, so no issues from, with them, I can buy that anytime. So some of the growth in different areas, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. If the cotton producer produces cotton first with no gin, it's, it's tough to find the market for that. Well, if, or you build the gin first and then there's no cotton producers, then you're just sitting around with an expensive machine in the shed. And so he says that the, the state uh, cotton association has, um, I don't know, subsidized or maybe even helped build, invest in cotton gins that incentivize local producers around it to start planting more cotton.
Well, I can assure you that I have never seen so much cotton in my life. Those cotton seed piles we saw should already be gone, long gone, as they get ready to market those seeds around Minas Gerais and a few to outer places in other states of Brazil, but mostly they stay around the Minas Gerais area. Well, I really have gotten an appreciation both for the cotton industry and for the Brazilian ag industry, especially in Minas Gerais. In fact, that was our last stop in that state here for this series. You have to really admire the hard work it takes for people that have come to an area where they've had to till the land for the first time, clear out some of the overgrowth on the Sahado region, and also take that area where they had no infrastructure, nothing more than a dirt road and water they had to haul from creeks, and turn it into something almost as modern, if not as modern, as the United States in just a little over a generation. See, because we look at it from Iowa, we're usually at least three to four, maybe five or even six generations removed from those who came and turned the prairie first to start the ag industry in this state. And so to see the work firsthand is something you don't always get to fully appreciate. So again, like I said, that is it for our trip to Minas Gerais. And we'll be next week touching down in Mato Grosso. And we're going to learn about the largest ag producing state in Brazil. We see a lot of similarities between Iowa and Mato Grosso with the amount of corn and soybeans that they are growing. But of course, it is Brazil, so things are always going to be just a little bit different. So I hope you'll join us on the next episode, and I thank you for joining us today. For the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, I'm Dustin Huffman. Coming up next time, we'll take you to the fields of Mato Grosso, where we'll see tillage machines, fertilizer applicators, and corn planters following only minutes behind combines. And that's something you don't get to see in Iowa. We'll see you next time on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network.